You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 122 of the Common Descent Podcast. This is a podcast about paleontology, earth history, life history, evolution, and so on, and today's topic is plate tectonics. Yeah. I'm ready to learn about this one, because this is this is geology stuff. <laughs> and I am so excited to talk about it, because we, we you know, mostly we err on the biology side of paleontology here on our podcast, but we do touch on geology stuff every now and then, and I always get very excited, and this is a topic that I think is super cool and foundational. Literally. So yes, fa- literally <laughs> foundational. So we're going to explore a scientific concept that is also a feature of our planet, past mm. and present. So we'll talk about what play tectonics is. We'll have a bit of a crash course in what is play tectonics. We'll talk about the history of play tectonics, both the history of like what has happened over the course of Earth history and the history of the science of plate tectonics. How has this extraordinary theory come to be? I'm excited for this one because this is one we've mentioned the effects of plate tectonics so much on this. Most episodes probably touch on it at least a little bit. Yeah, but we've not actually gotten into what it is is or how we know about it so yeah. i'm i'm really excited to learn about and i'm excited to learn because i am not a geology person <laughs> yep. so i learned a lot i have taught play tectonics <laughs> to college students so i'm all ready for it in addition to being a cool topic we are doing this episode because this was requested as all our episodes are this episode topics requesters were nils jackie and eric thanks for the request thanks everyone hey speaking of listeners We have a Patreon. We do. Where people can subscribe and donate to support the podcast, to support the thing they like listening to, to support science education for the masses, and get goodies. Yes, they do. Goodies on Patreon include director's notes for the episodes, bonus audio, bonus news, sometimes other stuff, and if you subscribe on Patreon at a certain level, we will shout your name out on the podcast in gratitude. This episode... New patrons are Seth, Suzanne, Shia, and a patron who has entered their name as Happy Birthday Ben from Dan. Oh, thanks everyone. And <laughs> thanks, Happy Birthday Ben from Dan. And Happy Birthday Ben <laughs> from us. <laughs> thanks everyone for supporting. If you are a patron, thanks very much. We hope you're enjoying your goodies. If you're not a patron, thanks anyway for listening, of Absolutely, course. Absolutely, yes. But if you want to support us, consider uh, being a patron. And if you don't want to subscribe for support, check the episode description for a one-time donation PayPal link. Yeah. We appreciate all support we get, whether it's financial or otherwise. (laughs) (laughs) And speaking of ways that you can support us, we recently have come into possession of a mailing address. Yes, finally we have a podcast mailing address people have been asking for a long time hey if we want to send you stuff where do we send it and we haven't really had a solid answer to that question before yep we have a mailbox yes so if you are one of those people who has been hoping to send us some things we will put our mailbox address on the blog on our website under contact us we will put our mailing address and hey if you didn't know you can also email us comment to send podcast at gmail.com thanks again to everybody thank you Before we get into the meat of the episode, we have one more announcement, and it is a big one. (laughs) This episode comes out in the latter half of September, which means October's coming up. Just around the corner. And every year for October, we do a special series called Spookulative Evolution. Yeah. We'll remind everybody what Spooky is about. Spooky is a show where we take some of our favorite and most historical monsters, creatures, and critters and think... What if this were to evolve under the typical rules of natural selection and evolution that we experience here on Earth? How could we get a creature resembling those monsters we know? It's speculative evolution, but spooky. Yeah. Every year for Spooky, we have a theme. We did classic movie monsters. Yep. We did monsters of Greek mythology. We did sea monsters. And now it is time for us to reveal 
that the official theme for 2021 Spooky is... Plant monsters. Plant monsters. It's so weird, and it's, I'm so excited. <laughs> We're so excited, not only because it's a cool topic, but because, as you might expect, we will not be alone. Yeah, because we can't talk about plants, just the two of us. That You're absolutely right. <laughs> so, for the first time, we will be having a guest with us for Spook E. All throughout October, we will be joined by our friend Dr. Allie Baumgartner, our friendly neighborhood paleobotanist, <laughs> to talk about plant monsters. I, it's, I'm so pumped for it's, this Spooky. It's going to be so good. Spooky comes out, there are four episodes. They come out the last four Saturdays of October, so stay tuned for that. And with the announcements out of the way, it's time for us to move on to our first main section of the episode, the news. News! Every episode, we pick some news in paleontology, evolution, life science, earth science, etc., to share with you, give the down low, the low down on the news, so we all stay up to date. Will, what new news have you brought? My first news is about some weird toothed sharks. Weird, most sharks are toothed, Will. Yeah, but weird. Toothed. Weird hyphen toothed <laughs> shark. Got it. <laughs> this is about some ancient shark teeth, uh, shark in quotes, this is sh shark cousin. Shark adjacent. Yes. That expand the range of a group of ancient sharks and might reveal some interesting things about how those sharks could have been living. Okay. This is research by Jiquan Guy et al. in Acta Geologica Sinica, the journal, and the article is by Enrico de Lazaro in Sci News. That article will be linked in the blog post. Yes, it will. So this research is focusing on a group of chondrichthians, so the group that includes sharks. These are not actual true sharks. Known as the Petalodontiformes, actually more closely related to these chimeras, or ratfish, or ghost right, sharks. Ghost sharks. Yep. The group of sharks with a million names. Talked, to that, talked about them a bit in episode 48. Sure did. This is a small fossil group. Uh, currently, according to the article, there's only 10 scientifically known, you know, described okay. uh, species. But they did pretty well from the Carboniferous to the Permian period. This research is on some teeth that were found in North China from Lower Permian Limestone. Their characteristic, as the name gives a clue to, for their petal-shaped teeth. Petalodonts. Yep. <laughs> they have a spade-like crown, so the top of the tooth is shaped kind of like a spade, like a little shovel. And then a long, tongue-shaped root. Huh. So the part that actually goes into the jaw is tongue-shaped is the way they described it. So I assume long and kind of tapering. Yeah, yeah. These have been identified. Uh, there were seven teeth, and all of them have been identified to the species Petalotus ohioensis, which is a species that lived about 290 million years ago, Permian. Petalotus is one of the longest known of the genuses of this group and is considered pretty representative of the order so that they. this is probably what most of the sharks look like. They are worldwide, but most of them come from Laurasia, so which was the northern half of the Pangaea section when it split and everything and before it fused. But even with that global distribution, this is the first of their fossil record in China. Oh, cool. And only the second in Asia. Oh, very cool. So this is a range extension into China, but also we've doubled the Asian petal tooths. Yeah. <laughs> like... <laughs> This is a, a very rare find, or at least doubled the records of finding them. There were seven teeth. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and this range extension led the researchers to hypothesize that this could speak to their behavior potentially, since to reach this area, they would have had to cross part of the Paleotetis Sea and might mean they were more active swimmers, once beforehand they were considered much more bottom-dwelling creatures okay and so maybe they were more travel happy than we would have assumed based on our previous assumptions of their behavior gotcha interesting that they might not have been able to get to this place otherwise yeah or would be a lot less likely to i don't know exactly what was thought of their behavior or their swimming abilities they didn't go into detail but this might give us a different way to look at them and is you know a range extension which is always exciting yeah which gives us a different place to look at them it informs us of a part of the world where we might not otherwise have expected to find these sharks, 
and now we can, which is very cool. Also, finding things in China is always exciting because there's a lot of really great fossil deposits in China. So perhaps there will be some really great fossils to be found in the future. Absolutely. Oh, man. Well, do I want to do my news about a range extension or my news about cool ancient ocean creatures? Mm. I'm going to go with the ocean creatures. (laughs) My first news is about cool ancient ocean creatures, specifically unusually large Cambrian carnivores. I like that title. Yeah, it's good stuff. This is research by J.B. Caron and Joe Moyshuk in Royal Society Open Science. And in the blog post, we will link to an article on Science Alert by Michelle Starr. The new fossil creature in question belongs to a group called Radiodonts. Mm. This is a group of ancient arthropod cousins. So arthropods are your insects and crustaceans and arachnids and such. These are ancient cousins of them, which show up during the Cambrian Explosion, Episode 9, and go on to become among the most diverse Cambrian predators, including lots of different lifestyles, swimmers, crawlers, suspension feeders, etc., and also include the largest Cambrian predators, notably Anomalocaris, the famous monster shrimp. This research describes new fossil remains of a new giant species named Titanochorus gainsi. Cool. This species belongs to a group called Herdeids. These are uh, radiodonts near arthropods that have a long head covered in a three-part carapace with a relatively short torso that they use for swimming. The article includes an artistic reconstruction, which I am showing to Will now, so that he may describe his reaction to it. Nifty. It is nifty. It's got a very spaceship feel to it. It looks like the carriers from StarCraft. It really does, A yeah. little bit. Yep. It, it, it has a very heavy uh, Tyranid High f- Fleet ships <laughs> feel to it. Like I said, StarCraft. <laughs> no. Like other radiodonts, its trunk uh, it cons- has many flaps for swimming, like Anomalocaris. It has stalked compound eyes, a disc-shaped mouth, long clawed appendages at the front, probably good for sifting through prey or grabbing stuff and bringing it to the mouth. This one is estimated to have had a total body length of half a meter, a foot and a half, which for the Cambrian is gigantic. Yeah, that's hefty. The only Cambrian radiodont we know of that got bigger than that is Anomalocaris. Okay, wow. Which goes half a meter up to a meter. And Titanochorus is thus the largest herdiad of the Cambrian. Notably, the carapace, the outer car, the shell over the head, is broader and flatter than most others, which seems to suggest that it was probably nectobenthic, living life near the seafloor. If not on the seafloor, at least near the seafloor. Likely grabbing up stuff with its little claw hands. <laughs> This is an interesting find, A, because it's big, and that's exciting. Uh, Bigger than we expect most things at this time period to be. The authors also note that its size, as they put it, foreshadows gigantism in later Herdeids, after the Cambrian. Oh! They got bigger. I did a quick Google search and I found a a description of at least one that, uh, that seems to have gotten up to two meters long. Ugh. Which, uh, that's six feet. Now now you're being ridiculous. Uh, I don't want to be in the same weight class as, <laughs> <laughs> as a giant murder shrimp. So this seems to be an early example of gigantism within this group. Also, Titanochorus coexists with another smaller member of this group named Cambroraster, which, might, which means a couple things. One, we might be seeing... Niche partitioning, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that maybe the two different size classes of these animals living similar lifestyles were going after prey of different sizes or living in different parts of their habitat. And the other thing is that it increases our knowledge of what the Predator Guild was at this time in this habitat. Yeah, now we have more of the members of the, the top of the food chain, so to speak. Yeah, the last line of the paper is... This study strengthens recognition of the Cambrian benthos as a rich habitat for an array of large predatory animals to exploit. (laughs) Exploit. (laughs) Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. That's cool. Like, that's, I like it because so much of the Cambrian creatures are just so alien looking. And this is 
also on that list of like I I personally have no clue how you were functioning looking like that. Mm-hmm. That's so bizarre and alien looking, and I love it. Also, and this is kind of a, a weird segue to it, but when you're talking about how it's hefty for the Cambrian, right? Yeah, you know, no half a meter is not big as far as marine predators go. No, like, certainly not today. Not today. Not for a while. Sorry, but it, it made me think. Of movies like The Secret of Nim and Once Upon a Forest, where you're following mice characters, and at some point <laughs> they encounter like an owl or a dog or something, and it's just this massive kaiju monster. Yeah. That's what the Cambrian was like. Like, yes. Most of your players are ditty bitty. So when something that's dealing in, that can measure itself with a foot, <laughs> comes along it makes me think of the hawk in a bug's life exactly yes yeah and i i like thinking of it that way because that puts it into perspective you have to scale down your perspective anomalocaris was a killer whale yeah <laughs> <laughs> it was monstrous and this thing would have been a real big shark going around so i like thinking of it that way well speaking of large predators my next bit of news is about a skin impression of Carnotaurus. Ooh, hey, that's a dinosaur. It is a dinosaur. This is the two-horned predator from South America, made famous by the Disney movie Dinosaur. Right. <laughs> it's the one with the pug face and the ludicrously tiny arms. Yes. <laughs> These little sausage arms. <laughs> this is research on a skin impression from one of the early findings of this dinosaur. I think the fossil that actually, if not named them, was found by the researcher who named Carnotaurus. Yeah, I have heard tell of these skin impressions. And, and I think, unless I, I may be mistaken, I think there's only one specimen of Carnotaurus. Oh, right. So this might not just be the first Carnotaurus. This might be the specimen of Carnotaurus. I forgot about that. And yeah, this <laughs> is that that skin impression specimen. They finally did detailed research on it. And that's what this is. Excellent. This is research by Christoph Hendricks and Phil Reed in Cretaceous Research. And the article is a press release by the University of New England in phys.org. So this specimen was discovered in 1984 by Argentine paleontologist Jose Bonaparte, who was the one to name it Carnotaurus, carnivore bull, flesh bull, flesh bull. (laughs) This was found in Patagonia, and the skeleton was preserved decently enough for us to know this dinosaur pretty well, but it was preserved alongside skin impressions. And at this time, we already suspected dinosaurs were scaly, but this was the first skin, uh, at least as far as the article said, of a meat-eating dinosaur that had ever been found. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And whilst it's been known for a while, and people have looked at it, no one has really done a detailed study of it until this research. Which is important, because not only was this the first skin impressions found of a predatory dinosaur, but it's also the most complete of any predatory dinosaur. Yeah, we don't get a lot of those. No. So this is a really good, as far as dinosaur skin impression collections go, there are skin imprints preserved from the shoulder, tail, thoracic, and possibly neck regions of this dinosaur. So across the body decently, we get a good smattering of samples, not just from one area, but across the dinosaur. And when they took a close look at it, they found that the scale pattern consists of medium to large, conical scales, or studs is what I saw them described as in one quote, which are then surrounded by smaller scales that are more elongated, diamond-shaped. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And these seem to be placed randomly across the body, not in a pattern, which is contrary to what we had previously kind of thought or suspected. Huh. They don't seem to form rows across the body. Uh, They also don't seem to change particularly, like, in size as you move down the body. Okay. You know, so it doesn't seem like there's a particular pattern to the placement of these scale groupings. In fact, there's little difference among them across the sections of the body. But they did find some variation in the small scales that surround the conical ones, the cone-shaped ones, with there being small elongated ones on the thoracic section, larger as they said, more polygonal ones around the scapula, so shoulder section, and then kind of more circular ones in the tail region. So they did find some pattern in the smaller scales, but not those big cones, and they didn't find any major pattern in the placement of these scale groups. Right, right. Uh, One researcher 
compared them in appearance to the scales of the thorny devil lizard from Australia. Oh, cool. Uh, so it, it, that picture that kind in your mind, not with the giant spikes it didn't sound like. Right. But <laughs> that kind of overall <laughs> scale pattern. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I guess it's not, I, I, it does not s- incredibly surprising to me to hear that there isn't a specific pattern. It's a little surprising. I, I guess more it's, it's informative about what dinosaur scales look like. Mm-hmm. I, for me, it's, I don't have a thing to compare it to because we have not a lot of information about theropod scales. Right. We talked about this, uh, you know, we have lots of feather impressions from predatory dinosaurs, but skin impressions are rare. In episode 120, we talked about tyrannosaurs. We have like scant little skin impressions here and there. It's very cool to have a well-preserved selection of skin impressions. And it's one of those discoveries that is interesting by itself, but will become more and more interesting the more we have to compare it to yes. in other predators. Yeah, Was Carnotaurus a weirdo with its haphazard scale placement? Right. Or is this kind of what dinosaurs more looked like? Yeah. I know that we have skin impressions with scales for other dinosaurs, mm-hmm. for a number of other groups of dinosaurs, uh, I don't know off the top of my head what those scales are like. Yeah. Oh, uh, man. I want a a, a, a a diagram of different dinosaur scale types as we learn more about them. Absolutely. And speaking of feather impressions, there are no indications of feathers on any of these skin impressions. Gotcha. It is completely scaly. Now, as we said when talking about T-Rex scales and uh, other examples like that, that doesn't mean for sure they weren't there. Right, because you can have feathers and scales on the same skin, on the yep. same spot, and not all sediments, not all environments are going to preserve feathers very well. But here we lack any evidence of feathers, so we can't say that Carnotaurus was feathery, and we don't have any evidence that it was. Right. Based off of this, at least. Which does seem like a, a relatively strong case for a largely scaly Carnotaurus. Yeah. Which is very cool. They did uh, hypothesize that maybe the scales could be used for thermal regulation like today's scaly animals. Sure, sure. Uh, And that that could be why we're seeing a fully scaly big predator down in a warm environment. But did they find evidence of hyper-advanced chromatophores that allow (laughs) Carnotaurus to become invisible when it wants to? That was the most stressful level of the Lost World (laughs) arcade game, bar none. Oh man, I didn't even realize it was in the arcade game. It was in the book. Yeah, it was. It was in the Lost World, the book. They they put it in the arcade game, and you'd just be in a room, and the camera would just whip back and forth, and then suddenly it would turn, and it would fade out of the mist coming at you, and you had to shoot it before it attacked you. And then the camera would go back to nervously look looking around and man on rail <laughs> shooter that's nervous makes you nervous that's awesome <laughs> well hey speaking of dinosaurs my bit of news our last bit of news for this episode is about a range extension oh of teratorns oh a group of extinct birds that includes uh, argentavis which we've talked about in the past one of the largest birds that ever lived these new teratorns were found at a time and place where we didn't think they were before that's cool. This is research by Marco Senizo et al. in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology, and we will link in the blog post to another article by Enrico De Lazaro in Sci News. Busy, busy, busy. Teratorns are an extinct group of carnivorous birds endemic to the Americas. They are related to storks and New World vultures, and often they are reconstructed, they are imagined as being similar to condors. American vultures, things like that. As I mentioned, some of them were enormous. In our episode 37.5, we had a little section where we talked about Argentavis, which is a teratorn from the late Miocene of Argentina that had a wingspan of 7 meters, more than 20 feet, and is estimated to have weighed about 70 kilograms, or 150 or so pounds. That's a real big bird. One of the largest birds that is known to have ever lived. I also love that because that really puts it in perspective how big wings humans would need if we did want to (laughs) fly. Like, (laughs) ooh. Teratorns are known as far back as the Oligocene, but in the late Pliocene, through the Pleistocene, so for the last three or four million years of the fossil record, they are only known from North America, not South America, though they are known there beforehand. This research 
presents fossil remains of teratorns from central Argentina in the late middle to early late Pleistocene, so around 100,000 years ago or so. Oh, this, we are so, that's so recent for such a cool thing. These come from four different localities, the, which, and they were collected across the 1900s at several different times. They include lots of limb and hip and vertebrae remains, and this uh, paper describes the remains. Not only are they much younger than all the other Territorn remains from South America, they also seem to be distinct from other known species. Oh, Now, the paper does not go as far as naming a new species, partially because there it sounds like there is another species that this could be, but there's not a lot of fossils of that to compare right now. So this seems different from most of the other species, but it could be this. We just don't know very much about that other species yet to know if this is the same thing. I always like research that does this, where they say, hey, we found something. It looks maybe newish. Yep. But mm, we're not going to say that. It makes me think of when you're playing Minesweeper and you put a little flag, <laughs> a, a little question mark instead of a flag. I'm not yep. saying there's a bomb here, but there might be a bomb here. Well, and this one's fun because it sounds like, if I read correctly, they're not naming a new species, not because there isn't enough fossil evidence of these new specimens, but that there isn't enough fossil evidence of the one that already has the name of this other species. Yeah, of what they, of what they might be. So they can't say this is or isn't that because there's <laughs> not uh, enough to compare. So possibly a new species of Teratorn much younger in South America. This is the first evidence of Teratorns younger than the Pliocene, which suggests these birds were in a place at a time where we thought they had already disappeared. Cool. Now, they do make mention of the fact that what we can't know for sure yet is whether they were there the whole time. The whole time? The whole time. Or is this a recolonization from the north? Did they disappear in, in South America and then the remaining ones in North America spread back down to South America? Yeah. That's hard to know. <laughs> Especially when the things you're talking about can fly wherever they want. And they mention that, too, that... If they disappeared in South America, it's kind of weird that they would have been in the north but not in the south because they can fly, especially since they are often reconstructed as vulture-like, and scavengers like vultures tend to have wide ranges because they can live in lots of places because their food is not very specific. Because <laughs> as long as things are dying, they're okay. But right at the end of the paper, they make a brief note on those lines that maybe they weren't vulture-like. <gasps> they point out that there are apparently similarities in the skeletons of teratorns that make them seem less like vultures and more like herons or pelicans. Oh. And indeed, the authors point out that a lot of teratorn finds, including some of these new ones, are found in ancient river environments. Huh. So it could be, and this it, this is not a main conclusion of the paper, it's just a little note they make, it could be that maybe their range, for at least for some species, was restricted because they were more habitat specific. Man, that I'm I'm repicturing them va you know, aggressively in my head, right? Fascinating. That's cool. Like it's cool to learn about this group just because it is such a characteristic fossil bird group. Yeah. Like this bird group, they mentioned this I think in the article, maybe the paper somewhere that the first Teratorns were found in 1909 in the La Brea Tar Pits. Yeah, that's iconic. That's yeah. classic. So it's Episode 67. It's exciting to learn more about a group like this. Uh, but also, yeah, it's... it's I want to know more about these big flying animals. Like, how were you living? Where were you living? And stuff like this is is very intriguing to piece together how they were functioning since we don't have anything flying around like this That's anymore right. so find more teratorns find more carnotaurus and dinosaur skin impressions find more giant cambrian arthropods find more whatever the other news was <laughs> hop to it sharks or something shark teeth <laughs> <laughs> hey that's the end of the news which means that it's time to move on to the main event after the break we will start discussing plate tectonics oh boy
plate tectonics is a theory. Now we've talked before about a theory in the broad scientific sense, meaning an explanatory framework, a way of thinking about a thing, a way of understanding a thing that puts evidence into context. Yes. Plate tectonics is not just any theory. It is a grand theory, <laughs> a major theory. I have seen it called a unifying theory. Which is a good term. In episode 56, we talked about the history of evolutionary theory, the, the theory of evolution, and that the theory of evolution isn't just, here's this cool thing that seems to be happening. Yeah. It's, here's this thing that seems to happen that unites our understanding of genetics and ecology and development and paleontology all together make sense as a whole in light of the theory that explains how life changes from generation to generation under selective pressures. Yeah, it doesn't just explain one concept, you know, or or even, you know, a fundamental functioning for like one group. It is how we understand life now. Yes. Similarly, gravitational theory does not just explain what happens when you drop a baseball or something. Gravitational theory is an theory, an equation that explains the motion and interaction of all physical objects in the universe. Everything. <laughs> Plate tectonics is a unifying theory of geology. I think oftentimes people think plate tectonics and they think continental movement. Yep. That the, these ideas are synonymous. They go together for a lot of people. And they do go together. But moving continents is not plate tectonics the same way that species giving rise to new species isn't what evolution is. That's yes. part of evolution, but that's not what evolution is. Yeah, it's one of the things evolution explains and describes. Yes. It's a emergent property. It's a thing that happens because of evolution. Mm -hmm. Plate tectonics is so much more than just the continents moving. <laughs> Bumping into each other. Plate tectonics is the theory, the framework, the explanation that explains all the surface features and processes of Earth. The continents, the oceans, the way they move and change over time, volcanoes, earthquakes, the things that are affected by those things, climate, life. Plate tectonics looks at all the physical processes that happen on the surface of the Earth and goes, here's why. <laughs> hey, that's where we live. <laughs> that's our place. <laughs> As such, plate tectonics is the sort of thing that can be described simply or delved into for an entire career to try to understand it. We're going to aim somewhere in the middle today. I was about to ask. <laughs> <laughs> and a theory with a really fascinating scientific history, which we'll get into in a little bit. But first, Geology 101, let's talk about what plate tectonics actually is. I'm so ready. Plate tectonics is a phenomenon that mostly involves the outer layer of the Earth. So let's talk about the Earth for a second. Like ogres, the Earth has layers. <laughs> the inner core, the outer core, the mantle, and the outside is the lithosphere. That's the solid cool part. <laughs> that's the part of the molten ball of rock that's in contact with cold, cold space, and thus is solid. <laughs> The lithosphere officially includes the crust, which is the solid rock outer shell of the Earth, the hard candy shell around the Earth, and the upper mantle. So the partially molten rock underneath it. Partially molten in this case, not like magma, but like wax slowly deforming. Which is almost more bizarre than molten rock. Right? Like, I can... Yeah, okay, you you heat anything up enough, it will eventually combust or melt. Yep. Uh, it's gonna do one of those. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I can get that. But just amorphous yeah. stone? Ba basically solid, but it moves over time. Oh, that's so weird. <laughs> Ugh. The lithosphere uh, tends to be around 60 miles or 100 kilometers thick, which in the grand scheme of the Earth is... Tiny. <laughs> the crust comes in two major forms, oceanic crust and continental crust. Oceanic crust tends to be denser and thinner, typically only about 5 to 10 kilometers or 3 to 6 miles thick. That's all. Continental crust tends to be lighter, less dense, and thicker, 
average ranging 30 to 50 kilometers thick or so, so 20 to 30 miles. In some places, much thicker, of course, like big mountain ranges. <laughs> because continental crust is thicker, it is raised higher off the surface of the Earth, which is why continents stick up out of the ocean. Yeah. Okay. Oceanic crust is called that because it's under the ocean, but it's under the ocean because it's the low point. Mm -hmm. It's thinner crust, so that makes the basins where all the water ends up. Yeah, <laughs> I love that it's, it's not like this is oceanic crust because it's where the oceans are. This is where the oceans are because this is where it's low. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the crust is split into sections called plates. This is basically, if you think of an eggshell with a bunch of cracks in it, that's what the surface of the earth is like. There are these cracks running through and around the surface, creating these separate curved sections, chunks of earth's crust. Plates are often described by their size, major plates, minor plates, and micro plates. Aww. The difference in size is the difference between most major plates are the ones that cover definitions vary, but cover over 20 million square kilometers of space. The main major plates under most uh, lists being the North American plate, the South American, Eurasian, African, Antarctic, Pacific, and the Indo-Australian. We're going to talk more about that one in a little bit. <laughs> to give you a sense of what this actually entails, the African plate is the crust that sits under most of Africa part of the Atlantic Ocean. The Pacific Plate is the crust that sits under most of the Pacific Ocean. The North American Plate is the crust that sits under most of North America, also Greenland, also the western half of the Atlantic Ocean, and part of Siberia. <laughs> These are not limited to specific oceans and continents. Some plates are part oceanic crust, part continental crust. All plates butt up against other plates along those cracks. We named them after the things we had already named. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they are not actually restricted to those things that we named. Yes. There are lots of minor plates and micro plates. There's the Arabian plate, the Caribbean plate, the Philippine plate, the Juan de Fuca plate, which is the one that is up by the Cascades. Uh, I've seen described as one of the micro plates. Generally, though, there are several main plates and then a lot of little small ones. The thing that links these plates to all those surface features and surface processes on the Earth is the way that they move. Every one of the plates is in motion, but not... Oftentimes you'll hear this described... I've heard it described as plates are b bumping into each other, yep. crashing into each other. I've heard them described like bumper cars. Yep. That's not true. That that makes sense if you picture it from the air looking at the continents. And Yes, <laughs> that makes sense if you're thinking about specifically continents moving. Yes. But that's not what plates are doing. There's no gaps between the plates. Like I said, cracks. Each plate is right up against another plate. They don't wiggle. They can't jostle. The movement that plates do is like a conveyor belt or an escalator, right? An escalator moves the stairs, right? The surface of the escalator is moving. And if you're on the escalator, it will carry you along. But the escalator itself does not go anywhere. Yeah. The plates are like a bunch of strangely shaped conveyor belts all next to each other. The crust within that area of the plate is moving in one direction. If you picture a conveyor belt or an escalator, the belt itself rises up at one end and sinks down at the other end and moves in between. That's what plates are doing. Yep. Crust material is rising up from the mantle and then sinking back down at the other end. Mm -hmm. The places where plates are right up against each other are called plate boundaries. Generally speaking, there are three different types of plate boundaries. Places where plates are converging, so the sliding motion is towards each other, or at least one is sliding into another, or two are sliding into each other. Divergent boundaries, where the plate motion, the conveyor belt, is moving away from each other, spreading, and transform boundaries where they're sliding past each other. Each of these different boundaries has characteristic features, which we're going to talk about here in a second. And if you are on the conveyor belt, it will move you. Mm -hmm. If you plant a flag anywhere on the planet, over time, it will move its position. Yeah. 
If there's a lump in the conveyor belt, it will move with the motion of the conveyor belt. That's what continents are. We're just living on those moving sidewalks in the airport. We are living on lumps of sidewalk. (laughs) (laughs) The low parts are oceans, the high parts are continents, and they're sliding around. Islands and continents and ocean, any topographic feature, is on this very slow ride of movement. Very slow, plate motion varies, but typically we're talking a few to several centimeters per year. Yeah. Very slow motion, but motion nonetheless. And yet it moves. Now, for some more detail, we'll take a close look at the three different types of boundaries and the features they produce. Divergent boundaries, places where the crust is pulling away, where one piece of crust, one plate, is pulling away from the plate adjacent to it. In these places, we see crustal extension, crust spreading, and as the crust pulls in opposite directions, It weakens, allowing molten rock to push upwards from the mantle. These are called spreading centers, places where the crust is spreading out, and all that rising magma tends to create lots of volcanoes. Typically, the most famously, these volcanoes form the mid-ocean ridges. Mm -hmm. These are places where molten rock is bubbling up to the surface, reaching the surface, and cooling into new oceanic crust. New crust is formed at divergent boundaries. This is the part where the conveyor belt is emerging up out of the ground. The most famous example, probably, of a spreading center is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is the line of mountains that runs across uh, the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It also cuts right through Iceland, (laughs) which is why Iceland is sort of bifurcated by these rifts. (laughs) That's a divergent boundary. Spreading center. I love this when compared to the conveyor belt uh, uh, analogy, because this would be a conveyor belt that is printing the conveyor as it rises. It is making (laughs) new conveyor. It's rising out of the conveyor belt factory. Yes. (laughs) There's a 3D printer there (laughs) that is cooling crust into new conveyor belt as it comes up. On the other side of our conveyor belt, where it disappears back down, That happens in plate tectonics at convergent boundaries, places where plates are either moving towards each other or one is moving into another. The motion of the plate is carrying it into another plate. Here, very typically, we see subduction. One plate will dip underneath the adjacent plate and sink down into the mantle to be recycled, to to be reabsorbed (laughs) into the earth. So it's a conveyor belt with no underneath. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Typically, where oceanic crust butts up against continental crust, the ocean crust, which is denser, will be the one that sinks. If two patches of oceanic crust beat each other, one will usually sink. This subduction not only returns crustal material back into the earth, it also creates a dip in the sea floor, a trench. Yep. The famous trenches of the seafloor are places where a plate is subducting. The Marianas Trench is where the Pacific plate is subducting underneath the Philippine plate. These also tend to be places where you get a lot of volcanic activity. As the crust is sinking, as the plate, the slab they call it, is sinking down, the interaction between the underlying slab and overlying slab creates melting which rises to the surface and creates volcanic activity, either in mountains on the continent, as is the case with the Cascades and the Andes, or in island arcs, like the Marianas Islands or the Aleutian Islands. This eruption of volcanic material also forms new crust. (laughs) This is where uh, a lot of continental crust is formed from these volcanic eruptions. As you might imagine, these conversion boundaries can also be the places where continents are dragged together. (laughs) When two continental crust pieces collide, you get mountains. They smush together, it pushes the crust up and down, it thickens the crust in both directions, like if you pushed a couple of rugs together, and you get an orogenic event. The Himalayas were formed by continent meeting continent, as we discussed in episode 119, The Appalachian Mountains were formed in an ancient continental crust collision. And the third type of boundary is transform, 
where two plates are just sliding past each other. Just rubbing shoulders. Just rubbing, grinding past each other. The most famous example of this, probably, certainly in our neck of the woods, is the San Andreas Fault Line, which takes up a good chunk of California (laughs) and is where the Pacific Plate is sliding past the North American Plate. Yeah, that's why it always uh, uh, bugs me when they talk about California falling off. It's not going to fall off. No. It's just going to slide away. It's going to slough southward. Yes. It's not even going to go, like, off into the ocean. It's just, it's moving down. Yeah. Against the North American plate. <laughs> now, I said those are the three types of boundaries. I That's mostly true. There is, like, a secret fourth type. <gasps> plate boundary zones is the term for plate boundaries where we don't actually know what's happening. Oh. Some boundaries are really complicated, so we don't understand them fully. So an example that I came across is the region, the Mediterranean Alpine region, where Europe meets Africa. There are thought to be lots of small plates there, so it's complicated. It's not necessarily a straightforward divergent, convergent, transform boundary. It's a mess. Yeah, it's just, (laughs) I love that it, it... Described as it's complicated. Yes, <laughs> it's, that's their status. Europe and Africa, it's complicated. Yeah, I uh, mean, in many ways. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, that's fascinating because I mean, it it makes sense on the large scale, but it also can make sense how this could get real messy real quick. Yes, because it's not like there's a set. This is what this plate does. This is what this plate is doing. So if you had lots of little ones, I could they could be doing all sorts of stuff or switching. Probably much quicker than the big ones. And indeed, even the big ones. So I've been painting a picture of a conveyor belt that rises at one end, sinks at the other end, and slides past its neighbors along the way. But not all plates do that. (gasps) Your analogy is breaking down. Each plate interacts with many other plates in a variety of ways. If you have a plate that is subducting more than it is spreading, it will shrink because it's being eaten faster than it's being generated. The reverse will cause a plate to grow. Plates will rotate over time as their different boundaries take effect. Some plates are moving north, some south, some are spinning. There's all sorts of complicated ways for plates to act. For some real-world examples, the Pacific plate that underlies the Pacific Ocean is subducting in many more places than it is spreading. It has a spreading center towards the south, but it's subducting under North America, under Alaska, under Japan, under the Philippine plate. Lots more subduction than spreading means the Pacific plate is shrinking. It's being eaten alive. It sure is, and it's being eaten by other plates. Like the North American plate is spreading at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, but isn't being subducted significantly anywhere. So the North American plate is growing over time. The surface effect of this, what we notice is that over time, the Pacific Ocean is getting smaller as the continents are moving in against it. The Atlantic Ocean is getting wider as North America moves west. This is why I've heard there be uh, suggestions that way into the future, we could see the continents re-meet on the opposite side of the planet from where Pangaea was Mm -hmm. as it consumes the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Now, it's not just plates changing size and potentially shape. Plates also come and go. You can imagine, particularly a small plate, might be fully subducted. Om nom nom nom. Om nom nom nom. Plates can also combine. Especially when you have uh, continental collisions, the subduction zone underneath that collision will often fail and you'll just fuse the plates. This is, I believe, what is thought to have happened or is currently happening under the Himalayas. Oh, yep, yep, yep. On the flip side... Plates can split. New rift zones can open up at a part where a plate is weak. This is seems to be happening right now in the Indo-Australian plate. The Indo-Australian plate traditionally was considered one plate, but recent evidence has shown that a section of it is experiencing lots of extension and lots of basins and lots of tectonic activity and seems to be forming a break a new spreading center. If that extension uh, extends enough, you'll start getting new crust bubbling up. This is also what's happening in the East Africa Rift Zone. It's a rift that is forming, splitting the eastern chunk of Africa off from the the west of it. Which is also why 
there is a lot of low elevation. That's where the Red Sea sits. Oh, yeah. Plates on Earth today, plates are not only in the process of moving, they are in the process of shrinking and growing and combining and splitting. It's it's such a abstract thing to think of that the surface of Earth is crazy dynamic in its behavior and movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just so lack the lifespan to experience it. So it it seems such a, like such a distant concept. Well, it's also so vast. Mm-hmm. Like when we talk about a Pacific plate, this is a chunk of Earth that takes up most of the space under the Pacific Ocean. Which is a huge chunk of our oceans. That's a <laughs> massive percentage of the planet Earth. Yes. And indeed, it's hard to see these and to understand these. Fortunately... Plate boundaries, in addition to all those other features we talked about, tend to leave behind some very characteristic clues. Plate boundaries tend to be the most tectonically active, geologically active parts of the planet, which means if you map the Earth's earthquakes, Mm -hmm. you map the plates. Yep. That's a major part of how we came to understand the edges, the borders of the plates, is that's where earthquakes happen. So you can map earthquake epicenters over days and weeks and months and years. And what you will find is that they cluster in lines at plate boundaries. Also, volcanoes, <laughs> yep. especially at subductions, especially at convergent boundaries. I mentioned that the Pacific Ocean is surrounded on most sides by subduction zones. It is also surrounded on most sides by volcanoes, which has a name, a ring of volcanoes, in fact. <laughs> aka the ring of fire yep the cumulative effect of all of this activity is that the earth's surface is constantly changing continents and islands are moving oceans are growing and shrinking or forming for the first time mountains are rising rifts are forming lots of earthquakes and volcanoes are happening and in the whole process the earth is constantly generating and recycling crust material well and that's something that i i think is such a a, a crazy thing about it is that it's not that you have these things and they're just sliding around it's that they are growing and being destroyed in directions uh so it's it's like if you you know with the conveyor belt metaphor uh, or analogy uh it's like if you had the conveyor belt it is being created on one end destroyed on the other and depending on the speed at which it has that you either move you grow in a direction or shrink in a direction. Yeah. And that's insane. It's such a weird thing to picture, but it's happening so slowly that it it seems static, so it seems stable. Yes. And indeed, for a long time, we thought it was. It took a while for our understanding of plate tectonics to become mainstream. Plate tectonic theory as we know it today is only several decades old. It emerged to prominence in the last few decades of the 1900s. And like gravity and like evolution, it has a great story. (laughs) Now, I'm not going to go through all the details of this story, but the Sparknotes version, how did we come to understand and accept plate tectonics theory? Like I said, for a long time, the prevailing thought among scientists, uh, parentheses, European scientists, (laughs) is that the Earth's surface was static and unchanging. Uh, This was a prevailing thought about a lot of things on Earth for a long time, that things as we see them today is how it's basically always been. Yeah, everyone I've ever talked to (laughs) says it's the same. Yeah, those mountains have always been there. And when when I read what those people who died (laughs) before me wrote down, it sounded the same. This worldview eventually gave way, uh, particularly in the 1800s, to uniformitarianism, the idea that the Earth processes that go on today have been happening slowly and gradually over the course of the Earth's history, changing things along the way. I love that while, you know, we we, we went from thinking that things have always been the way they are uh, to thinking that the things happening on Earth have always been happening that way is just almost the same statement of you know, things have always <laughs> been this way. Yes, no, that's what we're saying. Yes. They, they have they, always they, been this way. They've always been this way and thus things have changed. Yes. No, no, no. We're <laughs> saying it's always been like it is. Yes, exactly. <laughs> This viewpoint planted the seeds that would later give rise, for example, to evolutionary theory, episode 56, and plate tectonics. But before it was plate tectonics, 
the predecessor of plate tectonics, sort of the great-grandfather of plate tectonics, was the theory of continental drift. Yeah! Continental drift was introduced by German meteorologist Alfred Wegener in the early 1900s. Famously, Wegener looked at the continents and said, hey, some of these match. (laughs) He noted that coastlines, particularly South America and Africa, that if you look at the shape of South America and Africa, they look like they are puzzle pieces that fit together. Not only that, but the geology found on those coastlines also matches. The same sort of rocks, the same sort of fossils. The west coast of Africa and the east coast of South America seem to be the same thing. Two parts of the same whole. Wegener also pointed out that there are certain parts of warm, dry Africa that have glacial features, and there are certain parts of Antarctica that seem to show coal deposits, Mm -hmm. which are warm climate features. All this together, plus other stuff, led Wegener to suggest that the continents have not always been where they are today. He was not the first person to note some of these features. uh, I found a reference to the matching coastlines being mentioned as far back as the 1500s. Oh, wow. But Wegener popularized the idea, popularized the, the, the idea of continental drift, and popularized the idea of Pangaea. Oh. The idea that the continents were once joined in a large landmass. He, he saw the puzzle pieces and he put the puzzle together. And he put them together and his idea was rejected by the broader scientific community. Well, yeah, because he sounds crazy. Because he sounds it's ridiculous. <laughs> continents moving. Like, you said they fit together like puzzle pieces? What are you, a child? These sort of things just don't happen. Now, the rejection of this idea partially was, yeah, scientists were stuck in their ways. This was a challenge to a firmly held belief, but also because Wegener didn't do a complete job of explaining it. Mm -hmm. Like we talked about how Darwin had this issue in episode 28, Wegener could not answer one of the biggest questions how this happens. Yeah, I mean, that, that really is the glaring one. If I come up to you and go, hey, did you know that this thing we're standing on right now and that all these buildings are built on right now and that those mountains are on right now didn't used to be where it is right now? Yeah, okay. And who pushed it? Right. Like, what what are you talking about? How does it move? Wegener did not know. His proposal was, to keep it very simply, that the continents were basically plowing through the ocean crust, (laughs) which was not accepted by... scientists of the time because yeah that doesn't make any sense it's just like giant icebreakers <laughs> just <laughs> yeah <laughs> now there's more detail to it i'm sure i don't have details so for now wagner proposed icebreakers so in the early 1900s this idea had been proposed and garnered some attention but had not did not really take root certainly not right away over the course of the 1900s a number of other key points of evidence started to build this support for this idea. Much of that evidence did not come from studying the continents, but from studying the oceans. Yep. Most notably, mapping the ocean floor. See, for a long, long time, people kind of expected the ocean floor to be boring. Yeah. Yeah, flat, featureless plain. Old, right? Old as the earth. It's just been down there. Well, it's, we... it's all the way underwater. You know, yeah. how, how can anything interesting reach down there? Right. We've been mapping the ocean floor for hundreds and hundreds of years. By the 1900s, especially with new bathymetry techniques and such, we had started to get a really good sense of what the ocean floor looked like. And it was not flat and not featureless and not ancient. Geologists noted during this period that the sediment on the ocean floor is relatively thin. Not what you'd expect if sediment has just been building up there for 4 billion years. On top of that... The ocean floor is feature full. (laughs) There's basins, there's ridges, there's all sorts of structures, and very notably, there are mountain ranges. The mid-ocean ridges are extensive lines of mountains on the floor, the sea floor, across the world's oceans. The mid-Atlantic ridge runs from the Arctic down past Africa, Other mid-ocean ridges run through parts of the Pacific, the Indian Ocean. I've heard them described in multiple places like the seams on a baseball. (laughs) That's cool. run over the Earth. Mountain ranges thousands and thousands of kilometers long. 
One reference I read described the mid-ocean ridges as the most prominent topographic feature on the Earth. This gets to the, like those sea mounts that we mentioned when we were talking about the Mount Everest and stuff like mm-hmm. these undersea mountains that dwarf most of our on-land mountains. Yes. And we talk about stuff like that, but there's also mountain ranges. Yeah. <laughs> across the whole Earth. That just all over. We just don't think about them or appreciate them because we lack gills or effective lungs <laughs> to go appreciate them. This evidence uh, started to get us thinking that the ocean floor is, in fact, young and active. One of the biggest steps in understanding the true nature of the ocean floor came not from physical mapping, but from magnetic mapping. Oh. In the 1900s, researchers started using magnetic instruments to measure magnetic variations in the ocean floor. So here's how that works. Certain minerals are magnetic. Yes. So when a rock forms, right, it's molten and then it solidifies, tiny magnetic crystals suspended in the melt will orient themselves along with the Earth's magnetic field. They will point north to south. Yeah, while things are fluid, they can line up with the ma- the giant magnet they are on. Yes. And <laughs> stay that way. When researchers started mapping the ocean floor, looking for variations, they found two major groups of variations. Two different polarities. Normal and reverse. Basically what that meant is that in some places, the, the crystals were oriented with North being the north end of the magnet, and in other places they were flipped, with south being the north The north end of their magnetic orientation was pointing towards the south pole. Mm-hmm. Now, this was an early clue that the Earth's magnetic field is not static. It flips, north becomes south, south becomes north. The magnetic field, not the physical Earth. Yeah. It does not flip. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> But also, the more we started to recognize these features, the more we realized that these two different polarities are arranged in a pattern, a stripy pattern across the ocean. In the Atlantic Ocean, for example, if you mapped the entire ocean by its magnetic polarity, you get pinstripes across the whole ocean, from the Americas to the Old World. I've sorry, I've sorry, heard them described as zebra stripes. Ah, well, it helps us blend in with the rest of the planets. <laughs> <laughs> stripes running from north to south across the whole ocean. And the most important part of that pattern is that the pattern is symmetrical. <laughs> it is mirrored on either side of the mid-ocean ridge. Ah, that's awesome. Not only that, but around the same time period, geologists, using things like core samples began to recognize that the ages of rocks in the crust are also mirrored on either side of the ridge. The oldest oceanic crust is found farthest from the mid-ocean ridge, and the youngest crust is found at the crest (laughs) of the mid-ocean ridge, at the top of it. And indeed, the rocks at the crest of the mid-ocean ridge are always modern-day magnetic polarity. (laughs) Yep, makes sense. In the mid-1900s, another little clincher came around uh, due to work by Marie Tharp, a famous uh, geologist for this work, who was the first to note rift valleys running in the middle of the ocean ridges, which she interpreted correctly as places where the crust was extending, and later it was revealed that those ridges are also abundant with earthquakes. (laughs) <laughs> All this information coming together led to the idea, the new notion, a new theory called seafloor spreading. The idea that new crust is being formed at the mid-ocean ridge, formed up on the crest, and then spreading out in both directions. Getting older and older as it goes, going through different magnetic reversals, new crust in the center, spreading out to the sides, seafloor spreading. Makes sense. There was some resistance to this idea in the early days, specifically because it sounded a lot like Wacky Wegner's continental drift idea. Now, you may put a new name on it, but we (laughs) we recognize I've seen this homework before. And there was an issue, you see. If the crust is spreading, well, the Earth doesn't seem to be getting bigger. It's just expanding like a balloon. (laughs) So there must also need to be places where the crust is disappearing. 
and wouldn't you know it, mapping of the ocean floors also revealed deep, deep trenches. <laughs> I love that one where it's like, ah, you think you're so clever. If it's spreading, it has to be shrinking somewhere. Take that wide to, oh, look. Well, you would <laughs> expect that the ocean floor just doesn't get ancient, and it doesn't. <laughs> the oldest ocean floor on the planet is about 180 million years old. Wow. That's because so it's young. Because it's recycled. It's Jurassic. Mm-hmm. That's about it. The oldest continental crust on the planet is almost as old as the Earth because it's not eaten away up there. Yeah, it, it's left on top and it never fully gets to one of those edges mm -hmm. to get consumed by the, the molten Earth again. Not only did mapping of the seafloor reveal those trenches, but some of the most striking evidence for subduction zones came, again, from our just our best plate tectonic studying pals, Earthquakes. Yeah. Mapping of earthquakes found that not only does the pattern of earthquakes track the trenches and the mid-ocean ridges, but they also track a specific path underneath the surface. Oh. So when we measure an earthquake, we often think about an earthquake from the surface. Oh, yeah. it happened in San Francisco. It happened in uh, Tokyo. But earthquakes actually happen deep under the surface, where chunks of rock are grinding against each other or pressing towards each other or pulling away from each other. This doesn't happen fluidly. This pressure eventually causes uh, the earth to slip. Yep. To jerk and shake and, and, and break along f planes of weakness. Well, it makes me think of uh, snapping your fingers. Like The noise mm -hmm. that comes from snapping your fingers is not your finger and thumb moving past each other. It's your finger hitting your palm. But if I just hit my palm, it sounds like, and that's not much. But if I put pressure on it, I and can get a much more impactful, strong sound because I built up the energy pressing them together. That buildup of energy eventually releases, causing tremors. That's an earthquake. So the center of an earthquake, the epicenter of an earthquake, is not on the surface. It's under the deep underground. Well, when we track earthquake patterns at these trenches, at these subduction zones, what we find is they parallel the subduction zone, but they also form a line dipping deep under the surface. A prominent zone of earthquakes in a flat plane dipping 40 to 60 degrees down, extending deep hundreds of kilometers down into the earth. That's so intense. The earthquakes not only track the boundary between the plates from a surface perspective, but they track the subducting plate grinding against the underside of the plate above it. Yes. Eventually. As it dips down into the mantle. And then eventually it becomes no longer solid. <laughs> and then eventually there are no more earthquakes. There, there are, there's no more pressure to be had because you're goo now. This understanding of subduction and seafloor spreading eventually combined to what today we understand as plate tectonics theory. The Reese's Cup of <laughs> geologic theory. You got your subduction in my seafloor spreading. <laughs> These days, as I mentioned, we can use earthquakes and volcanoes to study those plate boundaries. But also, because we're living in the future, we have extensive techniques for ground surveying and satellite imaging, which means that in our current day and age, we can not only study the proxies of the motion of the Earth, we can measure the motion of the Earth. Yeah, and now we are precise enough, because beforehand, it was this weird situation of, <laughs> like, I promise it's moving. Right. Here's all the evidence that it is moving. Like everything that we're seeing tells us that it has moved and should still be moving. Yes. But everything our senses, our human senses can tell us says, no, it's not. Like, I'm not feel like other than every now and then when it shakes. But I, everything's where it was when we look back through history. Mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't. Now we are precise enough that we can actually go, oh, yep, there it did. It, oop. Well, and with a broader perspective, especially with satellites to help, we can pick two different parts on the planet and measure the distance between them <laughs> and say, yeah, the distance between the Eiffel Tower in Paris and the fake Eiffel Tower in Las Vegas <laughs> has changed. <laughs> 
year to year by centimeters. <laughs> They're getting farther apart. They, uh, they don't want to be near each other. I was about to say, are, are we getting to a grudge match? <laughs> uh, well, you know, I say they're getting farther apart. I don't, I assume that's true. I mean... Uh, in the long run, they're actually getting closer I was about to say, depending on your perspective, <laughs> eventually everything will get back to itself. <laughs> Oh well, yeah, once we were able to take a selfie of our planet, oh yeah, our ability to track this stuff changed dramatically. Now, there are still lots of unanswered questions, details we don't understand. Funnily enough, one of the biggest st- not unanswered, but still explored, still not fully understood questions about plate tectonics is the same one that Wegener didn't have an answer to is now that we know that they're moving and how they're moving, what drives the motion of the plates? Yeah. Why do they move? Why is it doing one thing on this edge and something else on this edge and all that good stuff? Now, uh, this is still explored. There are multiple answers. They're probably all right to some degree. (laughs) But it's one of those places where we're still figuring out the details. Generally, the classic idea is that convection in the mantle moves the plates that the mantle our our partially molten uh, layer below us moves in giant convection cells over time hotter stuff from the core rises up cooler stuff from up top sinks down and you get these big rotating cells like boiling soup yeah i was making think of like giant molten rock currents yes and that that slow movement over time pushes the plates along, drags the crustal plates along. Like the friction between yeah. the molten rock, which is a weird concept to think of. Well, it's if you put a thing on the water, yeah. right, it'll move it along. Yeah, we, we typically don't think of friction with liquid, liquid but it, it's still friction yes. between those two things can cause them to move. And again, not all of that is liquid like water liquid no it's very slow in many cases this is still thought to be a big part of it but on top of that um, especially more recently it seems scientists have been pointing to the effects of gravity oh specifically as a subducting plate sinks down into the earth it drags the rest of the plate with it oh yeah That's a huge chunk of rock being pulled towards the core, creating a force to move the plate. On the other end of things, I've also heard it described that at mid-ocean ridges, they are forming new rock that is elevated, that puts a gravitational force downward, pushing down on the rest of the plate. Not to mention the magma coming up is a spreading zone. It's creating new rock in a space that could be moving other rock off to the side. Yeah, that if 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 molten rock is coming up and cooling and forming solidified new crust, if it just kept doing that, it would just eventually reach up into the stratosphere. Right. Like it would just <laughs> keep going up, but gravity pulls it back down. Yes. So it never gets too tall. It gets real tall, but yeah. never gets too tall and instead, if it goes down, It has to go somewhere, so it goes out to either side. These concepts are often very uh, catchily called slab pull and ridge push. (laughs) It's it's the labeling on the doors of the planet. (laughs) (laughs) That perhaps on top of the mantle convection, literally on top of mantle convection, gravity is also pushing at the ridge and pulling at the subducting slabs. Now, uh, from what I've read, it seems like the slab pull has gained traction as this is possibly a really big effect. Yeah, a mover. A big mover. Some combination of those effects seems to drive plate tectonics to be plate tectonics. The motion of these conveyor belts. They're not. There's not a belt underneath them, like you said. They're being moved by a combination of forces. That's... Fantastic. I love that that is one of the potential causes, especially since we started this episode talking about unifying theories and referencing that gravity is not just what holds things down or makes them fall, (laughs) but is what dictates the movement of the cosmos and all the things within it, including potentially 
the tectonic plates of our planet. Yes. Gravity's big deal, folks. And so here we have the unifying theory of geology. The position of the continents and the oceans, the shapes of the continents and the oceans, where islands are, where islands used to be, the locations of volcanoes and earthquakes and mountains and rift zones, valleys, basins, and the fact that all that surface topography and surface activity impacts life and impacts the climate. It affects weather patterns and ocean current patterns. This super slow motion cycle of movement underlies, literally, everything that happens on the surface of the Earth. Yeah, it, this, it, it has its finger in every single pot. Yeah. This is a unifying theory of geology. It explains all the stuff on the surface to some degree. Which is such a... Uh, it's both such a, a straightforward and abstract concept at the same time. Where it's like, yeah, of course, if the surface of the planet is active, it's going to affect everything on top of it. Like, yeah. how could you not? Of course. You know, if I shake a table, nothing on the table is going to just ignore my shaking. <laughs> uh, it's going to react. But it's also just so big. It's so big. It's so big. And it, considering that it does affect everything can get mind boggling. <laughs> Speaking of concepts that are so big that they're mind boggling, we've mostly only been discussing the state of Earth today. But of course, uniformitarianism Lee, plate tectonics has been happening for a long, long time. And the surface of the planet has changed over that time. So after the break, we're going to take the deep time perspective and talk about how we study plate tectonics in the past. Ooh. As we mentioned, over the history of the planet, old plates have gone away, new plates have formed, Mountains have risen, oceans have come to be and disappeared, continents have moved and collided. We talked about how there have been times in the past, and this was part of Wegener's original proposal, where the continents all over the Earth have been joined into supercontinents, the most recent being Pangaea, but it is not the first supercontinent. And this isn't just guesswork based on what's happening today. There are ways for us to investigate these things into the past. Now, as with all things, we've said this a lot on the podcast, it becomes harder the farther back you go. Mm -hmm. We have really good understandings of how the surface of the Earth has changed over the Phanerozoic Eon, the last 500 million years or so. And you can find websites with great maps. There are great... Uh, GIFs, animations, there are great static maps showing what the Earth's surface looked like over time. As we go farther back than that, it becomes a lot harder. We don't have full Earth maps from, say, the Archean, because we don't have an Earth full of rocks from the Archean, so we don't have a lot of evidence from that time. The same reason we don't have, we don't know what global ecosystems looked like back then, because we don't have a globe worth of evidence for it. No, we have, we have tidbits, snippets. But whether recent or old, there is a long list of ways we can track how tectonic activity has changed over the course of the planet. One, which we've already mentioned, is sort of the obvious intuitive one. We look at the edges of the continents. Yeah. Right? The eastern edge of North and South America and the western edge of Europe and Africa are passive margins, meaning they are a place where continental crust meets ocean crust in the middle of a plate. Places where an ocean spread between chunks of land. So we can fit those back together. This is sort of the intuitive uh, third grade way that anyone can see how our modern continents used to fit together into a bigger supercontinent. This makes me think of an uh, episode of Bill Nye the Science Guy talking about plate tectonics and putting all the continents together and then showing them slowly spread apart mm -hmm. and demonstrating how that visually makes sense. And like we mentioned before, not just the shape of the continents, but the geology in those areas. Like puzzle pieces, it's not just the edge of it, it's the features on the piece. Yeah, that this has a piece of blue, and this has a piece of blue, and this has half a person's face, and this has the other half of the person's face. In the case of continents, 
rock layers can match up, fossils match up, magnetism in the rocks matches up, and mountains. Yeah. The Appalachian Mountains continue in Europe. Which is so cool. On the other side of the ocean. Speaking of the ocean, we can also look at the ocean. We talked about seafloor spreading and how new rocks form in the center and then spread out to the side. Well, we can track that spread. If you want to know what the Atlantic Ocean looked like 50 million years ago, find the rocks on the floor of the Atlantic Ocean that are 50 million years old. There should be some roughly equal distance from the mid-ocean ridge to the east and to the west and remove all the space between them. That's how wide your ocean was 50 million years ago. (laughs) When did the Atlantic start spreading? What is the age of the oldest rocks? Yeah. That's Jurassic. That's when your spreading center started. On the other side of that, we can find evidence for collisions in mountain ranges. When continents come together, mountains are formed. We see the Himalayas today are the result of the collision between the two landmasses on opposite sides of the Himalayas. We can rewind the clock and pull those continents apart from each other. In the fossil record, we can also use fossils themselves, the distribution of plants and animals, as evidence of where there were or weren't barriers. If you have a mountain or an ocean in the way, life on either side is going to be differentiated. If they're connected, life's going to be very similar. Back during Pangaea times, fossils on most of the continents have a lot more in common than they do today, now that the continents have spread. Yeah, once once they get isolated from each other, you get differentiation. But if you're all smushed together, you can mix around. Also, just as certain types of rocks are formed in certain habitats, certain types of rocks and minerals are formed in certain tectonic regions. Ooh. Subduction zones and spreading centers and mountain building areas tend to show specific types and forms of rocks and minerals. Certain metamorphic rocks are found in subduction zones or in places where mountains are being built where continents have collided. These can be clues to not only the type of tectonic activity, but also the timing of it. Uh, One fun example, uh, which was a term that I forgotten now I remember, uh, is ophiolites. Oh, I've heard that term. Ophiolites are a type of rock that are fragments of oceanic crust that have been lifted up to the surface when chunks of a subducting plate are broken off and carried up in mountains. during the mountain building from that convergent event. So these are chunks of ocean crust that get carried up with uh, the rising of mountains. It gets scraped off and carried to, uh, if not on the peaks, on these mountains. Yeah. That's awesome. So certain rocks and minerals form in convergent areas. Certain rocks and minerals form in rift zones. So we can look at the geology to find evidence of what was this region at a particular time. Not only can we identify types of tectonic activity, there are also ways for us to determine where a particular landmass used to be. Now, on the broad scale of this, there's sort of the obvious stuff, the climate and biology stuff. Yep. Right? Certain mineral formations or rock formations are indicative of certain climates. Certain plants and animals are indicative of certain climates. And if you find evidence of tropical climate in Antarctica or evidence of polar climate in South America, that's an indication that your continent used to be in a different place. Mm -hmm. But we can also get more specific than that. So in the first half of the discussion, I mentioned the magnetic signatures in rocks. That when molten rock cools, magnetic crystals will get frozen in place, aligned with the north-south magnetic field of the Earth. Well, not only do the crystals point north to south, they also have an inclination. They are dipped towards the nearest pole. Like a compass. Like a compass. If you are at the equator, your magnetic crystals will be basically horizontal zero degrees off of horizontal. If you are on the pole, on the magnetic pole, your crystals will point down. Into the earth. Into the earth, into the pole. And they incline more and more the closer you get to the pole from equator to pole. Because once again, the magnetic pole is not 
on the surface of the north and south of our planet. It is in the planet. Yes. Oh, that's cool. So, if you find a bunch of rocks somewhere on Earth, and the magnetic inclination doesn't match where you are north to south, that's an indication that your rock moved. This is a very handy and reliable way to determine paleo latitude. To say, this rock I'm sitting on, these this rock layer, has tropical plants and evidence of an arid environment, and the magnetic crystals are horizontal with the bedding plane, this used to be on the equator, even if I am now 60 degrees north or south. There are also ways to use magnetic uh, signals in the rocks to determine longitude. Oh. Uh, I don't, I didn't dive deep into this. I read, I came across a little bit. It seemed very confusing and I did not go deeper into it. Yeah. I I remember being taught in school. I I vaguely remember a teacher saying, we can't determine longitude. Yeah, I mean, because I was assuming we wouldn't be able to because it's north and south Magnet magnetism. Yes, there's uh, no east-west magnetism. Yeah, we don't have poles on the sides of our planet right. or anywhere around the planet. If your crystals are pointing east to west, that's an indication that your uh, chunk of crust has rotated. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it made sense that we could determine north to south, which also I love that technique because if we had like a temperate environment, well, that could be north or south. Yes. We have temperate zones both above and below the equator. Yep. But now you have an angle to go with it, so you can determine which half you are in, which is awesome. But yeah, I was assuming that would only work up, down, not left, right. Yeah. Uh, Did the fact that we can, I I am not surprised it's complicated, but the fact that we can is exciting. It sounds not iffy, but tricky. Yeah. Uh, But I don't know much about paleo longitude, uh, so, but it exists, Mm -hmm. and as a thing people have tried with some success to do and it makes sense that we can figure out the longitude other ways by tracking the movements left and right on the sea floor right and that way we can start to get an idea of all right well we know how high up on the planet you should be and based on this you should have been (laughs) this many miles left yep and we can use those together (laughs) all this information together has given us a good sense of what tectonics have done over time what the surface of the earth has done where plates have interacted, and, of course, mapping out continental movement, continental drift. Pangea, we have lots of good evidence for. There were earlier supercontinents, which we have less solid evidence for, although there are some clues, if not for specific locations of specific landmasses, which there sometimes are, but for global patterns. So I found some papers that discuss the fact that Different rocks and minerals and chemical compositions tend to be linked to different tectonic activities. So seafloor spreading, mountain building, subduction, etc. So the global abundance of certain types of rocks and minerals can be a clue as to what kind of tectonic activity was happening on the Earth at that time. For example, when there's a supercontinent where the continents are coming together... You would expect there to be lots of collision, lots of subduction, relatively less rifting and spreading. And that is reflected in global patterns of what kinds of minerals and chemical signatures we find. During Pangaea, we see certain patterns of mineral abundance, which also show up at different times earlier in Earth history, which might be a clue to when we had supercontinents. Ooh. That's that's very interesting. It's it's kind of crazy to think that there is a fundamental difference between when there are and aren't supercontinents. Yeah, there's a difference between what the Earth is made of at small scales during those times. Which, which one <laughs> kind of like I was saying, Earth both makes sense and is a real weird concept. It it seems like no, it should just be a big continent. It's like yeah, but that's different. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> so it's different. Oh. So we have ways of determining at the specific scales and at broad scales what was generally going on with tectonics, oceans, continents, etc. in the past. The farther back we go, the harder it becomes to understand these things. And that brings us to one of the other big questions about plate tectonics that is still waiting for a solid answer, how it started. 
Which, right there, that statement unnerves me. Right? It's like talking about how life got started yeah. on episode 100. And it's like, that one I can at least accept because we have planets without life to compare to and go, yeah, no, okay, it had to start here. But no, it's the Earth. This is the fundamental, this is what the Earth does. Yeah. What do you mean started? <laughs> and I know the Earth had to start at some point, but that's still weird. And yes, there was a time where the Earth did not have plate tectonics <laughs> as we know today. Where it wasn't, and then where it didn't and it have. It was, and then, yes, <laughs> there was a time where the Earth did not have plates. There was a time where the Earth did not have a crust the way that we understand it. <laughs> Our understanding of what the earliest Earth looked like is based partially on geologic evidence, partially on studying the formation of other things in, in space, and partially on modeling that information within the constraints of physics and such. Yeah, just a physics uh, simulation. To get a sense of what an early Earth would have looked like. Generally speaking, the Earth would have started not as a solid, massive thing. To put it simply, a ball of molten rock. Yep. And eventually a crust would have formed on the outer edge of it, likely as a single solid piece. Just the crust yeah. on the outside. As we leach heat to space. <laughs> <laughs> then later, tectonics, had, right? Uh, the crust would have split into plates and started spreading and subducting and all that stuff. But we don't know when exactly that happened. Generally speaking, there is a general consensus that plate tectonics had, had, been, had started on Earth by about 3 billion years ago. So during the Archean. Mm -hmm. There is some evidence that it may have been in place well before that. There are a number of ways that we look for evidence of plate tectonics on the early Earth. Some of it comes down to uh, similar as what I was saying about determining supercontinent times in the past, looking for global patterns of mineral content or chemical signatures in the rocks that we have from a certain time period can indicate what type of crust formation was happening back then? Are we seeing the types of minerals that are indicative of spreading centers and subduction zones? Are we seeing th the kinds of rocks you see in continental crust as formed today versus how crust might have formed in an early Earth without modern tectonic processes? There are also, I've come across a number of studies, of very specific. Here is a mineral. That seems to indicate a thing. For example, I came across a 2008 study that found zircon crystals, which are just the most useful crystals in the world for studying early Earth, that the composition of which seemed to indicate a formation temperature that matches what we see in modern-day subduction zones. Oh. So perhaps evidence of subduction zones. I also found a study from 2019 that found... Archean material, uh, rocks, minerals, and they studied the hydrogen isotopes in the minerals to determine that these seem to have formed from mantle material that had risen and cooled after being hydrated in contact with seawater, which could mean this was oceanic crust that was subducted and partially remelted and erupted again, as we see in modern-day subduction zones. Okay. And I found a 2020 study that was looking at paleomagnetic information in rocks in Australia a little more than 3 billion years ago that compared the magnetic signatures of rocks from two different formations at two different ages and found evidence that this area had moved between those times. And that if indeed it had moved, the rate of movement would match a typical rate that we see in continental movement today. Possibly evidence of plate tectonics like we have today. Okay. So there's all sorts of little point bits of information we can use to look at, all right, were we seeing subduction? Were we seeing continental movement at that time in the past? I love the parallels between searching for evidence of the earliest tectonic activity and searching for the evidence of 
earliest life Mm -hmm. and how many of them are, well, the chemical signature we're seeing in these rocks from this time could very likely be the result of living biochemistry. Yes. And, well, based on the kind of mineral we're seeing here, it is possible (laughs) that it formed in a situation similar to what we see in today's subduction zones. Yes. It's very similar that we do not have a three and a half billion year old subduction zone preserved in the rock that just got moved. We have a rock that might have come from a subduction zone. Yeah. And that's, ooh, it's (laughs) so similar and it's so super duper weird. Like I said, generally speaking, uh, geologists agree plate tectonics had started by three billion years ago. Maybe earlier, maybe as early as four billion years ago. Wow. But we don't know for sure. We also don't know how it started, which is, of course, complicated by the fact that we don't fully understand how it happens now. <laughs> like, <laughs> as we discussed, today... What it's... started this process, we don't fully understand. Yes. <laughs> today, it's thought that plate tectonic movement is driven by mantle convection, by the pulling of the slabs and the pushing of the ridges. So if at some point... Those forces must have taken over crustal dynamics. I've seen discussions about this, that maybe mantle convection eventually reached a point where it was strong enough to overcome the stability of the crust, or maybe the crust was weaker back then when it was hotter, that maybe the early crust wasn't dense enough to sink like it does today. So once the crust became dense enough, it was able to sink this is that we we don't we don't have a good idea of this so this is a this is this is a mystery we're still hoping to crack uh... and again as as is so often the case with things from further back we need more evidence from further back to do so the really crazy thing to me about stuff like this this the origins of life uh most of our truly ancient origin questions is like I don't even know what evidence we're waiting for. Yeah. Like, I don't... What what other things would give us better clues? I don't know. I don't know what you look for. Yeah? I mean, I'm not... Fortunately, there are a lot of early Earth geologists yes. who know better than we do <laughs> exactly. what sort of mineral compositions. Isotopes are used a lot for this. That makes sense. So, like, hydrogen, as I mentioned, hafnium and strontium come up a lot in discussions of plate tectonics because they are tied to processes that are often differentiated by different tectonic activities. Okay, yeah. So yeah, isotopes, again, like life, isotopes is what (laughs) it comes down to. Makes sense. Now, speaking of life, one other thing that we should absolutely mention, I mean, we are at our core, a paleontology podcast, and paleontology is at its core about life through time. And we have not spoken very much about life yet in this discussion. It's been weird. It has, it's been all, all sorts of, we're going to, all our listeners are going to I've been uncomfortable the whole <laughs> time. I'm just so nervously sweating. Take a little moment to appreciate how all of this activity affects life in the history of Earth. All that's been real cool what you said, David, but how does it affect me? me? What, <laughs> what does it mean Talk to me? Talk about dinosaurs already. <laughs> like, that's great, but what has it done for me lately? <laughs> Obviously, the changing shape of the surface of the Earth affects living things. The most clear, I think the most sort of intuitive way is as continents come together and spread apart, it affects where life can be. Yep. Right? When there was Pangaea, life was much more homogenous across the land masses. Oceans separate life. Mountains separate life. We taught episode 43 was about the Great American Biotic Interchange, a major event on the planet Earth which was of, of life on Earth, which was caused by the relatively simple event of two continents meeting. Boop. Every episode we've done about a specific place on the planet, Australia, New Zealand, Antarctica, South America, India, Madagascar, has dealt heavily with the discussion of where has this been over time? Oh yeah, like that's uh, at least a quarter of the notes I take whenever it's for a place is, all right, here's what the place is like. Here's how it's moved, Mm -hmm. and now we can talk about what's lived there in junk. And as it moves, not only do they make and break connections, but if you move from south to north, you're changing climates, habitat regimes. 
tectonics not only moves into different climate zones, it creates habitats. Yep. Like mountains are a habitat. Coastlines. When continents break up, you have more coastline. Yeah. Than you had before. The surface area of the edges of our continents has increased. Yeah. And that not only affects where life can live, it'll affect ocean currents and climate patterns, which can also affect where life can live. That's one of my favorite things is we often talk about plate tectonics and how it affects where the continents and land masses are located and how they are relating to one another. You know, whether or not they're connected or isolated, you know, whether or not they're on the bottom of the planet and frozen to death. <laughs> uh, but it also affects whether the oceans are connected or isolated. Yeah. And like, you know, it wasn't until Antarctica separated that it got a current around it. Yeah. And today, the Atlantic and Pacific are more separated than they used to be because the Americas are attached now. Yeah. We held hands and now we are we are separating. When we united, we separated the oceans. Yes. That's the tragedy it that's often not talked about. Came between them. <laughs> <laughs> not only uh, do tectonics determine the distribution of mountains and coastlines and ocean, also islands. Mm. Specifically, because I was thinking, how do... How does tectonic activity affect life? And a thought that came to me is all over the planet, we have island groups. Right? You have island groups like Hawaii, which is the product of hotspot activity. We don't have to go into this uh, deeply. Hotspot is a whole thing. But the short version is hotspots are places where volcanic activity happens not at a plate boundary, mm -hmm. but in the middle of a plate generally thought to be related to a particularly active portion of the mantle under the crust that is creating a rising molten rock that comes up to the surface and creates a volcano in the middle of a plate. It would be like holding up a flame under the middle of a frying pan and heating up that spot. Yes, but the mantle is not moving. The plate slides over that hot spot. So where the volcanic activity is happening moves yep as the plate is dragged over it so it's like if you put that flame under a piece of cardboard mm -hmm. and moved the cardboard and followed your scorch mark your volcanic activity creates a chain of islands also subduction zones where oceanic crust subducts under other oceanic crust tends to create rising volcanic uh peaks which can create island arcs like the marianas islands like the aleutian islands so tectonics is behind the creation of groups of islands. And as we have discussed numerous times in the past, island groups are crucibles of evolution. Yep. That's where you get tons of diversity. Also mountain ranges. You get tons of diversity. So not only creating new habitats and, and barriers and connections, but creating diverse landscapes where you can get diversification of life. Well, yeah, because one of the biggest tools for speciation is isolation, being split off from the rest of your population and therefore not sharing your genes. Well, if I move you away mm -hmm. from your other population, either by moving the continent or by putting a mountain range in between or by making a landmass that you can now populate that's not connected to anything. Yeah. You have tons of ways now to speciate. So like all of these, like if the earth wasn't moving, life would have speciated the first time. And then basically all <laughs> the barriers would be the same. Those are your habitats. Now. That's how it is. So there'd be very little reason for things to constantly be changing because your barriers aren't changing. So when we look at life through time, we are constantly asking questions about when did this group get to this new place? When mm -hmm. did this habitat arise? When did this type of landscape show up? What were the barriers to dispersal? The episode 71, we talked about how the Western Interior Seaway separated the two different sides of North America. We've talked in the past about how certain time periods are defined by the appearance of a particular group of animals or plants in a spot they hadn't reached before. As I mentioned, episode 43 was all about the interchange. Episodes 50 and 74 talked a lot about isolation of land masses. D there's so much that this ties in. D the, the story of life takes place on the set of the Earth, and that set is constantly changing. 
Also, I think we should make at least little mention of the fact that tectonic activity also controls uh, abundance and distribution of earthquakes and volcanoes. Yeah. Which has a little bit of an effect on life. Like, the most extreme and dramatic (laughs) of natural disasters on our surface is basically caused by this holy. Disaster, and and in some cases, extinction forcers. (laughs) Yes. Like, volcanoes, earthquakes, and the sort of uh, next degree tsunamis. Yep. And landslides. Yeah, that's tectonic activity, which has massive impacts on life. Well, and, and like, because earthquakes are dramatic, but they're brief. Yeah. They, they they happen. There may be aftershocks. They may bounce around the planet and cause a tsunami or something or side effects. But volcanoes, like, those are landscape shapers. Oh, yeah. Like, they make yeah. islands and they make new land and they can wipe out ecosystems. Yeah. We've talked about several times in the past about how certain pulses of volcanic activity in the past are linked to mass extinction events. Yeah, sync up with when we see mass extinction because they're coming up and just fundamentally changing the surface with what they're putting out there. Yes, not only the surface, but the atmosphere. Exactly. (laughs) So yeah, impactful. I think one of the best ways we can demonstrate the impact of plate tectonics on life is to go back through all of our episodes and find the times that we've mentioned... (laughs) continental movement and mountains and oceans and stuff hey listeners if you want to do a fun project (laughs) go back through and count all of those time stamp all the times we did that (laughs) uh it'll be a it was who let's see who can do it first let's make it a competition now before we wrap up our discussion of plate tectonics and plate tectonics through history there is one more minor topic i want us to just touch on Mm -hmm. uh we're not going to do a whole discussion about this because it's a question that comes up for play tectonics a question that does not come up often on our podcast because this is not the kind of question you can ask about most of the topics that we discuss on this podcast and that question is what about elsewhere yes what about tectonics on other bodies absolutely on other planets do other planets do other places in the galaxy in the universe have plate tectonics we've talked we asked this question in episode 26 about life yep do other places have life do other places have tectonics well the answer is uh, maybe kind of a little bit we don't know yeah yep there has been lots of research bits and pieces of research here and there that have found some evidence for tectonic activity of some form on other celestial bodies. So, for example, uh, Mars, Mm -hmm. which is the most studied in this regard, has volcanoes. There is evidence uh, potentially even of volcanic chains, like we see on Earth today in places like hotspots. There are also Mars quakes. Yep. The tremors in the surface of Mars, some of which seem to indicate active fault lines. Oh, wow. Now, or at least have been proposed to indicate active fault lines. Now, it's hard to know, is this tectonic activity like on Earth? Like, earthquakes can be caused by volcanic activity, and volcanic activity isn't always plate boundaries and such. And even if this is something similar, in what ways is it different? Is this tectonic activity like plate tectonics or is this mars's own version of surface activity and it's it's something that like us discovering it here on earth it has changed for a long time i remember seeing things when i was a kid saying that mars was a geologically inert yeah dead dead planet nothing moves nothing changes it is inactive on the geologic scale but we have detected quakes yeah since we've studied it in more recent years, we've now found that, nope, there are volcanoes, there are quakes. It is moving. It's now, doing stuff. But it, it, how much and what is not clear. I've seen it described that it could just be settling. Yes, exactly. It might be dying. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but there is some sort of activity. Venus has also been suggested to possibly have evidence of tectonics. Satellite mapping has found evidence of ridges and grooves and maybe even trenches, which 
might be the result of tectonic compression and extension. Again, for sure, no. Like Earth, maybe. Similar evidence has been found on Titan, Saturn's moon. That makes sense. Ridges and valleys that might indicate similar uh, tectonic movement. Also similar features, faults and extensions and ridges have been noted on Europa. Mm -hmm. That was going to be the next one I asked about. (laughs) There was a study in 2014 that was looking at these uh, evidence of crustal extension. So places where the crust is stretching, the sort of things we see at rift zones or future rift zones today. And the study, it sounds like, basically calculated how much extension there was and how much more crust there should be if that much crust was generated in extension, which is not there. Gotcha. Which suggests that if there was crustal extension in this one place, there should be crustal recycling, subduction of a form somewhere else. So maybe there's some form of tectonics going on on Europa. There are a handful of other places in our solar system where there is potential evidence of something like plate tectonics, if not plate tectonics proper. I love that Titan and Europa came up because often if you, it, people are, if you, you're saying like, why do I recognize that name? But I'm not a, a they space also buff. came up in episode 26. Uh, yes. <laughs> These are the plants that we always reference in sci-fi stuff as being the places we'd colonize in our solar system. And because they're... Mars, Titan, and Europa are the next best things other than Earth. And they're top candidates for looking for evidence of life. Yep, because they're the things in our solar system that are most like our planet. Not super duper like our planet, but they have the most in common. And I also love this from the point of view, I could see how it might seem, how the question might come up of, yeah, but we know it's, we, you know, we don't, we don't have all the answers here on earth, but we've been studying it for so long. Why can't we just then identify it Mm -hmm. on another planet, especially now that we have satellites and your satellites was such a big deal for IDing it here and measuring it here. Mm -hmm. Why can't we then just do it there? But it took us a while Oh, yeah. To actually confirm. And a lot of satellites and mapping and all sorts of things. And disagreements and debating before we actually settled on, okay, yeah, it is moving. It's moving in this way and this much. So it's likely that probably not the same amount of time, but depending on how many, how much funding and satellites we get there, Mm -hmm. it'll take a long time to get a similar amount of evidence for a planet we are not even walking on yet. And it also brings up, now this is the thing, I'm sure I've said this on the podcast before, the thing that blow, that gets me, that really is, is too big a thought for my brain. There's every likelihood that the rules are different on other planets, that their crust operates differently. Oh yeah. That a version of plate tectonics on Mars or Venus or whatever would not actually be recognizable to us on Earth because the the foundational rules, the building blocks, the unifying theory on that planet is different. I often liken it to thinking about different realities where yeah. physics works differently. Yeah, different planets, the earth science, the geological, climatological foundations might be different. So just like plate tectonics on earth is tied into and links and is foundational to all of our surface stuff. Well, if that process is different on another planet, then all the stuff is different. Yep. So we're not even going to find exactly the same evidence, potentially. Well, like one of the first things that popped in my mind with Mars is, does it even have equivalent to oceanic crust? Mm -hmm. Where most of our activity is happening for the movement to happen. Does it have thin sections for that to happen. And that I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I I've, don't know what the structure of Mars's crust is like. like. We have sections of Mars that seem like they might have been rivers or oceans. Right. And we have mountains. Yep. There are low places on Mars, but I don't know what they're like compared to the high place. Are they denser like our low places? Right. And the high places less dense? Or is it just shaped that way? <laughs> right. Who knows? I also came across a 2017 study that took an even broader view of this question. (laughs) 
and modeled the formation of exoplanets. <laughs> so exoplanets means planets outside our solar system. They looked at lots of different stars and lots of different exoplanet situations and put together what we would expect about the formation of these planets to estimate how many of these exoplanets is plate tectonics even possible on. Yeah. Would they form the type of crust and mantle capable of plate tectonics? And their study estimated at least two-thirds of the exoplanets they looked at would have a crust too buoyant, not dense enough for subduction. Oh. Which means Earth-style plate tectonics could, in theory, not happen on most of these exoplanets. Now, again, this is complicated by the fact that we don't know how plate tectonics got started on Earth in the first place, so it's very difficult to know if plate tectonics could get started somewhere else. Yep. And then, of course, they tied it into the then-yet-broader question of, is plate tectonics a requirement for life? Yeah, if you don't have active surface the way Earth does, would that hinder the origination and then evolution of life? Yeah. Or at least Earth-like yes. life. Do you need to have the kind of active surface that we see on our planet to d develop complex ecosystems over time? Yeah. Is that part of why we're here? <laughs> yeah. That our Earth is tectonically active. Now, these are, uh, th these are too big. These are too big uh, <laughs> questions for us to answer. And when I say us, I mean humanity yeah, yeah. so far. Yeah. It's, well, it's like even, you know, looking at those exoplanets and making that statement, this is also based on our understanding of the composition of planets that we know are there based on the spectrometry, spec, you know, the spectrographic. Right. Based on how much their stars dim when they pass in front of them. Yeah. And what kind of light we get off from that shadow yeah. and like. Pla we are, planets we will never touch. Yes, that we unless humanity lasts into the billions of years. Yep, we're never going to see those planets or discovers wormholes. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> now our scale, I fear, has gotten out of hand. <laughs> but I think that's a great place to wrap up the bulk of our plate tectonics discussion. However, there is a little bit more tectonic discussion to be had. Because we have a patron question. We do. So our discussion of plate tectonics is not quite over. Our patron question relates. One of the goodies you can get on Patreon at a certain level of subscription is the ability to ask us questions to answer here on the podcast. Will, what do we have? We actually have two questions oh. for this episode, both from the same patron, Jackie. Hello, Jackie. But our first question, we covered in episode. So, great. Jackie asks, we seem to know a lot about the history of continental movement. What science goes into knowing when the continents were where? That's a great question, Jackie. Rewind this episode about, I don't know, half of the discussion. <laughs> hip, hip, hop, hip, hip. And we answered that one. We're ahead of the curve. Ah. So Jackie asks a follow-up question, being prepared for our sneakiness. Uh, I see. In the India episode... You talked about how the Himalayan mountains are only about 50 million years old, but the Appalachian mountains are much older. Are there any mountain ranges that have been formed and already eroded to nothing? Is this even something we would be able to know? Now, that's a great question. I mean, they're both great questions. Yes. That's an exciting question to get to answer. Short answer, we do know that certain mountains on the planet today used to be taller and yes, there are mountain ranges that are thought to have mostly or entirely vanished over the history of the Earth. That's so humbling. <laughs> right? <laughs> mountains. Now, uh, mountains tend to be formed, as we discussed in this episode, where plate convergence is happening. Either on the side of a continent where ocean is subducting, as in the case of the Andes, or where two continents collide, as in the case of the Himalayas or the Appalachians. That crustal compression, that, that, that shortening, that colliding, forces the rocks to uplift into mountains, and then over time, weathering and erosion, bring them back down. The Appalachian Mountains are an old mountain range, so they're not as tall and pointy and sexy as the Rockies and the Himalayas. They, they all just look like little bumps. 
Yeah, they're mountains, <laughs> but just bumps, just little bumpy hills all over the place. Uh, when my girlfriend came to visit, my girlfriend grew up with the Rockies, so when she came to visit here in Tennessee, uh, saw the Appalachians and was making fun of them. Yeah, well, it's like, I, those are hills. Yeah, I grew up <laughs> in around these mountains, the Appalachians, and so I, in my mind, I always kind of had that picture of like. Are there really pointy mountains? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's just in movies, right? Like, because I've driven over Blood Mountain like a dozen <laughs> times. And that, no. Nah. It's not that big a deal. It's just, a, you can go to the top of it and stand on it. It's just round. So mountains do shrink over time. And indeed, uh, one example, a uh, prominent example, the Pangean Central Mountains, a mountain range that formed across Pangaea when Pangaea was coming together, a collision that included, in part, some of the modern Appalachian Mountains. At least some parts of the Pangaean Central Mountains are thought to have all or mostly eroded away. Wow. Now, this of course brings up the question, as Jackie brought up, how do we know where there used to be mountains, right, if there are not today? Some of that evidence can come from fossils, right? Fossils are broken up by mountain ranges, right? You can't disperse across them, so fossils will be different, just like across oceans. Mountains tend to have particular effects on climate, so you can get evidence of climate effects in an area where the mountains used to be. You can see evidence of the deformation of the crust. Oh, yeah. So certain metamorphic rocks are formed under mountains, so if you find those... You have evidence that there maybe used to be mountains there. Because, like we mentioned, mountains are affected by gravity. So when you have mountains form, they affect the area under them. Yeah, and of course the crust is deformed while the mountains are being built as well. So you can find evidence of that deformation even if there's no mountains still there. Cool. And of course, mountains disappear through erosion and weathering, and all that stuff goes somewhere. The material eroded off of mountains is washed down the slopes and deposited in nearby basins, low points. So we can find evidence of mountains in the adjacent basins that are full of eroded mountain sediment. Yeah, nothing just disappears. This is how we study ancient mountain ranges in a lot of cases, is we study the soil in the basins nearby them. While I was doing a little bit of digging for this episode, I even found a couple of uh, uh, references to ways we can estimate the sizes of ancient mountains. Now, often you'll hear it said that the ancient Appalachians were as tall as the Himalayas are today. And a large part of that is just the Himalayas are really tall because they are a continent continent collision. So were the Appalachians. So they were probably similarly tall. But uh, some geologists have uh, attempted to determine the size of ancient mountains by calculating the volume of the sediment in those basins. <laughs> Here's how much sediment came off the land. What if we put it back? Yeah. There's our mountains. It's the mathematical equivalent of just gluing all the pieces back together. Yeah. <laughs> I also found a site that mentioned, and I didn't find any details for this, but that the amount of deformation in your crust can indicate how much weight was above it <laughs> and potentially be a proxy for mountain size. And I found at least one study that was investigating isotopes, chemical isotopes related to rainwater, where it is known that the isotope ratio in rainwater varies with altitude. Oh, wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. So by studying these isotopes in the right conditions, you can get an estimate of your paleo elevation. And in fact, the study I found was specific. It, I forget where it was, but it was looking at a particular site uh, and saying in the Eocene, this mountain we're on was a thousand meters higher. Wow. Based on these isotopes. That's way more specific than I was expecting. Right. So to answer Jackie's question... Yes, mountains have come and gone, and yes, there are some mountains that we that seem to have gone. Yep. And we can know that. We can even potentially get a sense of the space they took up. Yeah, how how mountainous those mountains were. And that officially wraps up our discussion of tectonic activity <laughs> for this episode. This was a lot of fun. Thank you to all of our requesters. Thank you to Jackie for those patron questions. Also, Jackie was one of our requesters and that I didn't check. That might be the same Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. If so, Jackie is a very happy listener today. <laughs> 
As always, check that blog post after the episode for more links and images and more information. Thank you to everybody who listens and supports us on Patreon, who supports us by suggesting episode topics. If there's more with this topic you want to hear about, let us know. If you want us to go on an episode-length tangent about one of the topics we touched on in this episode, send it to us. We got a message recently where someone was asking, is it just patrons that can suggest episode topics? Oh, yeah. And the answer is no. No. Anyone can suggest episode topics. We take requests from anyone who gives them. They all go on the list. Uh, Email, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. Text in person. Text in person. (laughs) If you meet us in person, feel free to tell us a suggestion. (laughs) I've had friends just be like, hey, this one. Yep. (laughs) We've had friends who said, hey, why haven't you done this one yet? (laughs) I already requested it. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's the downside when it's friends is they can (laughs) can actually chase us down. They know where to find us. (laughs) You can reach out to us in the social medias, in the emails. Hey, uh, check our uh, WordPress website for a mailing address these days. That's pretty exciting. Stay tuned for more episodes. Stay tuned next month for Spooky. Woo! We're going to talk about plants. We're going to have Allie on. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm so excited for it. We release episodes every fortnight, which means two weeks from the release of this episode, you can look forward to episode one, two, three <laughs> of the Common Ascent podcast, where we'll discuss another thing that our listeners and patrons have suggested we talk about. And with that, uh, insert some clever comment or pun about play tectonics. Ah, good one. Thanks. Yeah, I was working. I thought about that the whole episode (laughs) I was waiting. (laughs) You up all night thinking of that one? (laughs) (laughs) And then uh, roll the outro music. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.